Welcome to our women's panel. I'm going to quickly do introductions here. Right next to me is Jackie Hill Perry. She's a wife, a mom, a writer, and an artist. Then y'all know Mary Cassian. Then we have Candy Finch. She serves as assistant professor in women's studies at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And then on the end, we have Amanda Peacock. She's a pastor's wife. She's married to Gavin Pe Peacock, who we heard yesterday, and she's also a mom. So I'm going to be asking each of you questions, but y'all just feel free to jump in, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. So Mary, I'm going to start with you. I read almost all your books, <laughs> um, and I love how you encourage women and exhort them to know what they believe and why. What would you say are some of the most important convictions complementarian women should have and be able to communicate well? <laughs> and just, <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, just like quick and off the top of my head. Um, most important convictions is uh, word of God, that it's God's word and that God has communicated in a way to us uh, so that it's reliable, that uh, it's clear enough that we don't understand everything, but God has revealed himself enough that we can know uh, we can't know everything with certainty, but we can know some things with certainty. So I, I would say that, um, yeah, it just goes for anyone who, who upholds the Bible as truth because that's where we go. That is our standard. So it, it is your view on Scripture, really. I think that is central to your beliefs. Yeah. Um, Candy, what would you say? I know you're teaching women all the time. Uh, what would you say are some of the top feminist mindsets that Christian women have adapted into their thinking, and how can we combat those? And I would love to hear any of y'all's thoughts on that. I mean, I know I think we're all affected by feminism more than we know. Um, so, yeah. There's a lot of ways. Uh, I, let me just give you three, but there's a lot that you could speak to and, and I've written on as, as well. And so I think the first thing that I think Christian women – I'll say this for myself, that we believe that equality must mean sameness, and that's not a biblical definition of equality. And I think as a culture, we've imbibed on that idea, and I think in the church, we have accepted it. I also think that Christian women, what happened in the second wave of feminism, where you have Betty Friedan saying that for work to be valuable, it must be paid work, and so you had women going into the, the workforces thinking that's where they're going to find fulfillment because there was something missing in their minds staying at home and investing in their husbands and children. And, and then they, lo and behold, Time did a magazine uh, edition on this in the 90s saying, why are women, they, they got everything they asked for and they're still not fulfilled. It's because our ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment will never come apart from a relationship with Christ and in the same way I think Christian women are seeking fulfillment, it may be in an education, it may be in a job, or they're looking for that in a, a husband or in their children. If you make any of those things more important than God, you're going to be left wanting because we have a, a, a God-shaped hole that only he can fill, and the things of this world will always be uh, lacking. I think the, the third thing would be that uh, we think that to be pro-women must mean that we are feminist. I was at a conference in Salt Lake City in, in the fall, and there was a group uh, that was exhibiting there, and they're advocating for maternal feminism. And I, I was, to be frank, I was quite surprised, because if you know anything about the feminist movement, it's decidedly uh, anti-motherhood from Margaret Sanger to what happened in the second wave. So I was dialoguing with these women and they said, I said, why, are, why maternal feminism? And, and they were Christians and, and they said, we believe that we're just pro-women. I said, well, but why maternal feminism? And they said, well, we want to encourage motherhood and feminist, feminism allows us to do that. And I'm, I, I was really disappointed and, and um, sadden that they think in order to be pro-women, that means you're a feminist. Jesus is pro-women. The Bible is pro-women. We don't need that title, feminism, to be pro-women. We're Christians. And I think too many in the church have thought that thought. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
I have one more thing that that I've really noticed in the in the church is that uh, one of the things that in feminist theology and in feminism is that it really exalts the importance of experience. And so instead of having theology dictate and make sense of our life experience, we do it the other way around. We take our experience and say, well, this is my experience, therefore that is um, how I will interpret the Bible. And I just think of a classic, uh, classic example of this is uh, in a woman who is abused and who has had um, a very hard, uh, very difficult experience in her marriage, and perhaps her husband has been very boorish and very um, unloving. And I know I've, I've seen this in situations that I've dealt with with abused women. Also, you know, the husband will use any justification possible for his um, sinful behavior, and sometimes he'll use scripture to justify his sinful behavior. And, uh, and so that women will c woman will come out saying, well, obviously um, God's way is not good because I've not experienced it to be good. Instead of saying God's way is good, it's sinful man that cannot be, uh, you know, has a difficult time living it out. Thanks. Um, Jackie, since we're right here, I've read some of your pieces. I love your heart for young women. Um, and you openly share your heart, your testimony. Tell us a little bit about how the gospel transformed your way of thinking. I know you're going to share here in a little bit your testimony, but about being a woman and how you would encourage young women who are here or watching who are struggling with opposite ideals from the culture. Yeah, um, I guess giving context, I was raised in a single-parent household. My mother was really the, not the epitome, but she exuded this I don't need a man mentality. Um, I could... You know, I'm self-sufficient. She also exuded just a disrespect towards men. I didn't know that it was disrespect until I got married, where it was just like, oh, I can't talk to you any way I want. Cool. Um, <laughs> I didn't know. And so growing up in that context, but also with same-sex attraction and gender confusion, I think I'll, I'll share later, but my idea of gender and what it meant to be a woman and what it be meant to be a man was just all over the place. Um, and so I think for me, embracing womanhood came with embracing the gospel, um, being changed by what Christ uh, did for me on the cross, being changed by the Holy Spirit, but also community. I think I would not have had a renewed mind if it wasn't for women walking with me, but also equally men walking with me, um, having pastors to lovingly uh, just guide me in this, but also to show me that all men are not like I deem men to be. Um, but I think for young women, my heart, as of late, is simply for them to believe that the Bible is true. And in believing that the Bible is true, also seeing that what God calls women to be is wise and good. I think the culture is trying to communicate to us that it's not good, nor is God wise in doing and saying what he is. But it's like, no, like, the culture doesn't define the character of God. God defines the character of God. And so if I could submit myself under that, then I'll actually experience joy and peace. I think the tension is believing that we'll find happiness outside of his will. Um, and so that's just my, my encouragement and has been my encouragement to young women lately. Yeah, yeah. that's just so great. Yeah, thank you. Um, Amanda, you have a grown son and a grown daughter. Well, practically yeah. grown. She's in college. Um, what ways have you and Gavin raised your son and daughter differently? Your daughter to be a woman, your son to be a man. Okay. Um, so firstly, teaching them from scripture. Um, secondly, trying to model that ourselves, not always very perfectly, um, but trying to model that as a man and woman, husband and wife and mother and father. Um, and in that role model um, is this kind of understanding, your children get their first understanding of um, respect for authority when they see um, how much, uh, sorry, <laughs> they get their respect for authority when they see um, how well their father leads their household and how well their mother submits to their father. But also um, their understanding of leadership comes from the way that their father loves their mother as well. So that's kind of the foundation. And then along the way is just correcting our children as well, correcting them so that they're kind of 
conformed to the word and not to culture because they have all these external pressures coming in upon them. For Ava, um, who's our daughter, she's 19, nearly 20, it was really kind of um, encouraging her to cultivate this gentle and quiet spirit. So she wasn't in competition with men. Um, she wasn't grasping at equality, but she was satisfied and content to be a woman. And so we also encourage that because both of our children actually have leadership and nurturing qualities. So we, we tried to, tra we trained them in these being gender specific. So each of them would play team sports and our daughter captained her team sports, but they were single sex sports. You know, when they're young, they kind of play in mixed sports and then as they grow, they should be in girls' teams and boys' teams. You ask my husband, he's a soccer player. He would not play soccer with girls <laughs> or women. Um, so we encourage that. And then for, um, also in Ava, this nurturing and mothering aspect. So we encourage her to babysit, to look after younger children. Um, and then with her particularly, um, as a mother to a daughter, thinking about her career choices. So as a young woman, you don't know whether you will remain single or whether the Lord will provide you with a husband and children. So we've kind of got her to think biblically and think, right, well, what is God's pattern for woman? And that's primarily to be a helper. And if she gets married, to be a helper to her husband and to be a mother to her children. So thinking then, okay, I need... Um, a profession that if I remain single will be enough to sustain me, to provide for myself and be independent. But also if I do marry and I have children, is that something perhaps I could do from home if we needed to bring in more money? Say for example a teacher, you can do tutoring at home. So just really thinking about those things, even as she was kind of in her early teens, thinking what that might look like for her. Um, and it's interesting, actually, because our daughter wants to become a teacher. She's at university at the moment. And our son, um, he has expressed his masculinity in that he, he is a mixed martial arts trainer. So he trains other young men in mixed martial arts. But he's also a social worker. And he works in um, a secure unit for at-risk youth. <laughs> And that's a pretty uh, tough job at times, uh, mentally, but also physically. And interestingly, and this is what I love, is that um, they have this mechanism in the unit which they call EMB, and it's Emergency Male Backup. So sometimes there are these situations where a youth has to be restrained from physically harming themselves or others. Well, they have to then call into play this EMB because they need the physicality, they need the physical strength and the protection of a man. So I just love the way that I can see um, Ava's femininity and Jake's masculinity being displayed even in the professions that they've chosen to do. So, Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. Let's um, talk about women's ministry for a minute. Um, I'm going to ping back to the middle here. Mary, um, what does a biblically faithful women's ministry look like? And I would love to hear any of y'all, Candy, you especially too. Okay, what does a biblically faithful women's ministry look like? I don't think that I can tell you that there is one pattern. I think that that um, that it depends on the women and their giftedness and and uh, what you know what what God is doing amongst them and and in them. So I, you know, I I tend to think of women's ministry not as a program. Or, um, it is it is based on people, and it is based on life, and doing life. So I think it can look different from church community to church community. I don't think there's a, a particular formula, um, but I do think that God raises up women into positions of leadership and teaching um, in local assemblies to spearhead that at times, and to uh, help um, with overseeing the, the well-being of the women in the body of Christ. So. Wow, that's, that's great. Awesome. Candy, what about, um, what would you say are some of the biggest issues you see in the classroom that c women are facing right now, complementarian women, in terms of feminism, in terms of... Um, 
Well, I, I have the privilege of teaching masters, women that want to be involved in some type of ministry. I think they have been cooking in this cultural soup. And so a lot of, they've imbibed upon a lot of the ideas of feminism. And so a lot of what we do is, I did that as a seminary student. I really struggled with what I was learning at first because my, my thoughts were the culture's thoughts. And so that's part of it, getting to the, what does God actually say, despite all of my experience and things that I've grown up believing. I, but the truth is, what we're facing in the classroom is what you're facing. I think uh, there's a lack of holiness we, we grow in knowledge, but if we're not also growing in obedience, the Bible calls that immaturity. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of immature Christians, mm -hmm. unfortunately, in our seminaries and our churches, because head knowledge must work itself out in obedience. And as far as complementarianism, I, I've been distressed as of late because I'm excited that we're encouraging Let's encourage women to do what they are biblically encouraged to do, but I think some complementarians have gone too far. And uh, just one thing in, in understanding 1 Timothy 2, I've heard some dear brothers and sisters say that when Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over men, and in, in the context of the church, they're saying that that verse means a woman should not, that, that a woman doesn't have uh, as, as long as she's not authoritatively teaching, she can do whatever she would like in the church. They're saying as long as she's not the pastor, she's not the authoritative teacher. That's not what that Greek word didasko means. There's not authoritative teaching and unauthoritative teaching. And, and uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think that's helpful among complementarians. I think it's unbiblical, as a matter of fact. And so I'm distressed by that, and we're having that discussion how to apply that faithfully, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Amanda, I would love to hear you talk about respect and submission. You know, we know as women, as Courtney talked about, we're called to submit to our husbands. Practically, what does that look like in your marriage, and, and how should we respect men who are not our husbands? Okay. Um, so one of the ways I primarily submit to my husband um, is that the laying aside of my own plans to help him fulfill his, um, which isn't always easy because as women you can be quite busy and if you're anything like me, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I like to get, I've got a calendar and I've got my things organized and if anything upsets my apple cart, I kind of go to pieces, not trusting in the Lord, right? Um, so for me that's really been a challenge but... Um, I think that when my husband requests my time, I must give it to him and I must do that gladly. Um, for instance, a, a few uh, months ago, I was preparing a talk on 1 Peter 3, verses 1 to 7. And I was getting kind of really agitated and a bit fearful because I hadn't been feeling very well while I was trying to do this talk and I knew that the deadline was soon. I was preparing it for a retreat. So I was thinking, oh no, how am I going to get this done? I'm not feeling well. It was kind of late in the evening. And then my husband comes to me and he says, I've got this manuscript here. Would you read it for me, please? And I'm like, and it was really long. <laughs> and um, it was actually for, the, for this book that he's just written with Owen. So he, had me, he said, would you read these chapters for me? And I had this battle going on inside me between doing what was right, as God had called me to, to help my husband, but also fear fearing that I wouldn't get what I needed to get done. So I could feel this wrestling going on, and then I'm thinking, hang on a minute, this is 1 Peter 3. I've got a hope in God. I've got to put my trust in God. I've got to cultivate this gentle and quiet spirit and not fear what is frightening, but do what is right. And I love the way the Lord seems to do that often. Um, you know, when you're studying a scripture of passage, he then gives you this opportunity to put it into practice. So I did. I helped my husband. I put aside my stuff and I helped my husband and I got the talk done. So that's just one example of um, the way that I submit to my husband and the way that I'm trying to grow in that as well. And then for women um, with men, treat them like men. 
I know that sounds a really obvious thing to say, but I think we can, in our day and age, we can treat men like they're our girlfriends. We can speak to them like they're our girlfriends and act with them like they're our, girl, they're our girlfriends, but they're not, they're men. So that I think we really need to regain that distinction between our girlfriends and the men that we associate with. Um, I think that just small things like allowing a man to open a door for you, allowing a man to carry a heavy burden for you. Now, I'm not incapable of doing either of those things, but I think it re really re helps to reinforce the masculinity of a man. Chivalry, it's, it seems to have died. Um, so just in simple ways like that, um, and then biblically, I love the example of Abigail. Abigail in 1 Samuel 25, 1 Samuel 25. Um, she's this amazing example of bold and respectful speech and action. She esteems appropriate masculine authority. And she even provides um, this wonderful example of the skill of reproving, speaking the truth in love. And this is all to a man who's not her husband. This is to David. So that uh, chapter of scripture there is really packed with all these aspects of biblical femininity of a gentle and quiet spirit. Mm -hmm. So reading that, I think, is a great illustration. Thanks, Amanda. Jackie, I just want to end with one last question to you. Um, I loved what you talked a minute ago just about the gospel being center and the gospel being above everything else. And, and you're a, a writer, you're an artist, and, and you have so many follow followers. And how do you keep your home, you have a little girl, how do you keep your home at the center um, of your life right now? Um, I, think, I think when I got, before I got married, I think when I was courting, I still had all these ambitions. So I'm a really ambitious person. So it's like, okay, I'm doing this poetry, I'm doing music, I'm writing, I'm speaking, blah, 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 blah. But the question that I wrestled with and attempted to submit to was, if God's will for you was to serve your husband, serve your children, and lay aside all of your ambitions, would you be okay with that? And so I literally lived life that way. And so I think living life that way causes me to look at everything that I do with the right perspective. Because I know that this, God really, I don't think he cares as much about this as much as he cares about how I respect and love my husband. Mm -hmm. I think he cares more of how I respect him, love him, serve him, serve my daughter, serve my local community, serve my local church, and then maybe this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so I think um, the gospel just saying, like, I am first and foremost called to be a woman who honors God, not does these cute panels, which are great, they're edifying and all of that. But I, I, I think God puts more weight on my primary, primary call. And I think that's come through the gospel, but also community. I have older women around me that I am super accountable to that will always like nail into me um, my womanness and being okay with that. I don't know if any of that made sense. No, but it totally did. I think that's like yeah. a great way to finish this panel. So thank you so much, no Jackie. Um, thank you. We all well just thank these panelists for giving us their time. And um, at 10, we will come back in here for the general session. All the men will join us. So thanks.